This happened in 1987 when I was about 15 years old. I used to live in this small town in northern Ohio. Back in those days, I was the neighborhood paperboy for a while, and I would deliver the newspapers almost every morning before school. During the summer, I would often ride my bike around to the park or go hang out with my friends down by the lake. The point is I was often seen on my bike, a lot. So it was unfortunate that during one of my paper routes, a reckless driver blindsided me, which resulted in my left thigh being fractured and my bicycle being completely destroyed. It took me about three months to recover, and by the time I did, the paper had already hired a new delivery boy, and I was left without a bike. And on top of all that, they never caught the guy who ran into me. There's no real nice way to say this, but my parents are neglective assholes, and I stopped talking to them years ago. At the time, my injury was viewed more as an inconvenience in their eyes. The local police department wasn't really much better either. It was pretty much run by a family who had zero interest in enforcing the law and seemed to be more concerned with blackmailing prostitutes in exchange for sexual favors. Nobody really gave a rat's ass that some drunk asshole nearly ended my life. But what could I really do about it? I was only 15, and I just had to make the best of things and carry on. Shortly after I was released from the hospital, my friend Kyle invited me over to his house, claiming that his parents were out of town on business, and he had discovered a bottle of Jack Daniels that his father had forgotten to lock away in his liquor cabinet. I, of course, obliged. Without a bike, I unfortunately had to walk everywhere, and I knew better than the hitchhike in this backward-ass town. By the time I got to Kyle's, it was around 7pm, and Kyle was already piss-drunk, with about 90% of the bottle already gone. After about 20 minutes of sitting on his couch and listening to him drivel on about how he wanted to smash the math teacher, Kyle vomited on the living room floor and promptly passed out. So, being sober and frustrated, I decided to make the long trek home in the dark. Getting out of Kyle's neighborhood was simple enough, but there was a long, dark stretch of highway that I had to traverse to get back to my place. Making this trip during the day was no big deal, but it could be quite daunting at night. There are no streetlights on this road, so unless the moon was out, it would be nearly pitch black. It was a half moon out that night, so things were a bit obscured, but you could still see enough of your surroundings to make your way. My house was off of the first intersection you came upon. The rest of the way was well lit from there, but it was still a good three mile hike to get to the intersection. I was about a quarter way down this road when I got this inexplicable sensation that I was being followed. I turned around to see what appeared to be a dark figure standing in the middle of the road, barely visible in the moonlight. It appeared to be just standing there, so I figured it was probably one of the many drug addicts that lurked around these parts. I quickened my pace and scolded myself for forgetting my pocket knife, which I usually carried on me for protection. But I didn't want to show that I was afraid, so I didn't walk too fast, but I also didn't take my time. About another five minutes pass, and I look behind me again. The dark figure was now on the sidewalk, and was now noticeably closer. Again, I want to point out that it was just standing there. It was not apparent to me that the figure was running or walking towards me. It was almost as if every time I would turn around, it would just stop and stare at me. Obviously, this is not the type of experience you want to have when you're walking home alone in the dark. So I wasted no time in making my way towards the intersection. It wasn't until the lights of the intersection came into view that I heard a pounding behind me. Something inside me told me not to turn around, but I couldn't resist. My worst nightmare was confirmed when I saw the dark figure barreling towards me. The distance between us was closing fast, and from where I was, I could tell that there was something in its hands. The way it was holding this object made me conclude that it was a knife. I ran as fast as I could, tearing past the intersection and across the road to the entrance of my neighborhood. From the entrance, you could see the intersection clearly. When I turned back for the last time, I could see a deranged looking man standing under one of the streetlights with a massive butcher knife in his right hand. He appeared to be about six feet tall, 
with a balding head and a beard that went down to his stomach. He was severely out of shape, but someone who could easily overpower a 15-year-old. As I darted down the neighborhood street, I could hear a crazed voice shouting from behind me. If I ever see you again, I'm going to cut your head off. As soon as I got to my house and slammed the door shut behind me, I nearly passed out from exhaustion and panic. My parents were not home at the time, so I ended up locking myself in my bedroom and eventually passed out after hours of just staring out my bedroom window. I didn't call the cops simply because it did not occur to me in my panicked state of mind. And by the time I could think straight again, I came to the conclusion that the corrupted police force would not take my claim seriously. And you can pretty much apply that same reasoning as to why I did not tell my parents. As soon as I turned 18, I left that shithole behind and have never looked back. In some bizarre way, I now view that deranged man in the darkness as a manifestation of everything wrong with that town. I grew up in the village of Dunning, Nebraska, and I have very fond memories of that place, but simply put, as I started getting older, I soon realized that there was absolutely no future for me in Dunning, and I enlisted in the military when I was 19. Growing up in Dunning during the 1980s is something that I would akin to a setting in a Stephen King novel. You had your religious nut jobs, wisecracking town folk, and an atmosphere of isolation. That's not to say that the town was inherently creepy or anything, it just seemed cut off from the rest of the world. It's definitely not a place for social media influencers to visit, because if you're not into outdoor activities, you're going to be bored as shit there. To the east of the town is the Nebraska National Forest, which our family would often visit when I was a kid. Being such a close-knit community, I was pretty much friends with all the other kids my age. Something that we often enjoyed doing was going fishing in the nearby rivers. I recall that my school was taking a field trip to the National Forest, and I couldn't attend for some reason. I can't seem to remember if it was because of poor grades or bad behavior. Probably a mixture of the two, to be honest. When I got out of school that day, I was pretty much the only kid left in town. So this was one of those rare times where I would go fishing by myself. As soon as I got home that day, I spent about 20 minutes doing my household chores before packing up my fishing gear and setting off on my bike. My friends and I would usually fish in the middle Lou River because it was very close to the town. However, since they weren't with me on that day, I decided to head down to the Dismal River, which ran along the west side of the town before merging into Middle Lou. Unlike Middle Lou, the Dismal River was sort of on the outskirts of Dunning. To give you a lay of the land, beyond the Dismal River is no man's land in every sense of the word. Aside from some few residential properties, there is absolutely nothing for miles but hills and trees. I spent about 30 minutes casting my line but I wasn't catching anything much to my dismay, so I relocated my operation upstream towards where the two rivers intersected. Suddenly, I could feel a dense pressure in the atmosphere. I'm sure most of you can relate to that creepy, unnerving feeling you get when someone is watching you. I did my best to ignore this feeling and continue fishing, but there was something that kept drawing my attention towards one of the dead trees that was situated about 30 feet from the riverbank. The exact year was 1988, when the entire country was experiencing droughts that caused many trees to die off. It wasn't long before I could smell something foul in the air. It was a thick, putrid stench, like something died and had been decomposing in the sun all day. But strangely, I did not see a single vulture in the sky. They would usually be swarming any animal carcasses shortly after they died. Curiosity finally got the best of me, and I set my fishing rod down and went to investigate the dead tree. As I approached, I noticed that there was a hole in the ground, like someone had dug a grave and forgot to throw the dirt back over the hole. As I got closer, I could feel goosebumps up and down my arms. Once I got close enough, I peered down into the hole. 
and I will swear until my dying day that this is what I saw. There was a body of a young girl lying at the bottom of the hole. I vaguely remember seeing a mangled nightgown that was wrapped around the body. As a 12-year-old, I didn't scare easy, but this sent me fleeing back into town, bawling my eyes out. By the time I got back home, my dad was home from work. I told him between sobs what I had seen. My dad was very good friends with one of the deputies at the Blaine County Sheriff's Office, and he immediately called him and relayed to him what I had seen by the river. Me and my dad met three Blaine County deputies near the spot where I had seen the corpse. They even brought a trained canine along with them, but after hours of combing through the riverbanks, they could not find a single thing. I was later scolded by my father for making up stories, and that I should never waste the police's time. As punishment, I wasn't allowed to go fishing for months after this incident, which really sucked, because there wasn't much else to do in Dunning. Even after all these years, I still stand by my story. It may have been something of a supernatural nature, but I did see the body of a young girl lying at the bottom of that hole. I didn't have a wild imagination as a kid, and I may have misbehaved every once in a while, but I would never make up a story about seeing something that awful. The smell, the position of the body, the dirty nightgown. I remember too many details for this to be some kind of delusion. There is another possibility that only occurred to me as an adult. If what I experienced wasn't a supernatural phenomenon, could the sheriff's office have covered up something? The hills of Nebraska have their secrets. In the 80s growing up, we didn't have all the distractions that kids have today so we had to make up our own things to do. Many times, this meant going outside, going hunting, or making up games. For our generation, our parents told us to be outside, but for us that lived in a small town, these activities were in abundance. There was one type of activity that almost everyone took part in, and this was riding some type of ATV or dirt bike. For me, this was one of my biggest pastimes when I was a child, when I was just seven years old, a man on the highway was selling a YZ80. Now for me, this was an awesome sight. All I could think of was getting on that dirt bike and riding all day around where I lived. But my dad had other ideas. He thought I was much too young to have something so awesome. It took a few weeks of constant badgering for me to convince my dad to buy it for me. But in the end, my perseverance prevailed. I was so excited and could not contain myself. Now, I did not know how to ride a dirt bike at the time. The first time that I got on the machine, I popped the clutch, did a wheelie, and flipped the bike. Now, this did not inspire any confidence with my father. It took a little time, but I quickly got good at riding this badass machine. Luckily, I was able to use this open field to perfect my skill as a dirt bike rider. As my friends learned, that I had a dirt bike. They started taking me around and showing me a few trails around my town. It slowly became one of our pastimes. We would do this almost every single day after school. It was one of my memories as a child that I really hold on to. There was one place that we went riding. This place was called Emmeline's. I never really knew the person or why it was called this, but there was an old, abandoned house way out in the middle of these woods. This old house had been out there for many years. It had a lot of good riding trails around it, from hills to creeks to wide open trails that you could really open your machine on. Most of the time, there were two or three of us that would go at the same time, but there were times that I would go out on my own. I had done these solo rides several times before this day. On this day, I could not go right after school. I had some homework from school that I could not get done at school, so I had to go home and get it done. I could not ride until everything was done, unfortunately, but I think most people know that. So it was later on in the day that I could take my daily ride. It was about 6 in the afternoon before I took off. 
Now, this was in the summertime, so it didn't usually get dark until around 8.30 or so. So I knew it would not be a very long ride because my dirt bike did not have any lights on it. I would have a few hours before I had to return home, though. Emmeline's was only about five minutes from my house. As I got on my machine, I could not help but put a smile on my face. I absolutely love this thing. I love to be on my bike. After fueling up the machine and checking it over, I put it in neutral, kicked the bike, and started it up. Now, a few days before I had broken my clutch cable, so after starting it, I had to give it a push, jump on, and throw it into gear. This was no big deal, I had done it before. I got rather good at it. My dad had to order the cable and it had not come in quite yet. Off I went, as happy as a young boy could be on his dirt bike. I got to the trails and immediately jumped right in. I'd been ripping up the trails for about an hour and not seen anyone else on them. I guess everyone had better things to do on that day. In the middle of the woods was an open field. This field was about four or five acres big if I had to guess. It had a fence built up around it. The fence had been up for a long time. It was rusted and broken in quite a few places. But for the most part, it was intact and in decent shape. Like I said, I had been riding hard for about an hour and had felt the call of nature. Since I had not seen anyone around, I decided to just stop on the trail and relieve myself. Now, I must mention that the dirt bike I had was a racing bike, so it did not have a kickstand unfortunately. So I had to stop and lean it against a fence post. As I was relieving myself, I noticed that it was very, very quiet. Now. I did not think too much about this because I had been riding for about an hour straight. The dirt bike was pretty loud, so I just figured it was because of me. As I was going to the bathroom, I heard some rustling about 50 or 60 yards away from me. I looked that way and I did not see anything at first. So I assumed that it was probably just a little squirrel since they were everywhere out here. Finishing my business. I started to feel anxious for some reason. This heavy feeling came over me, like I was being watched. I look all around me. But once again, I could see nothing. The bike was only a couple of feet away from me, so I started walking toward it. I took one step and heard something start walking behind me. I immediately turned around expecting to see one of my friends trying to sneak up on me. But to my astonishment, there was absolutely no one there. Trying to shrug the experience off, I walked to my bike, but every step I took, I swear I heard one step behind me. By this time, I was so scared, I did not know what I was going to do. Figuring the only thing I could do was run the few feet to my bike, jump on it, and take off. This had to be a seamless action though, since I did not have a clutch to take off with. I had to kickstart the bike, push it, and throw it into gear all in one motion if I was going to get away from whatever was behind me. Gathering up all the courage and strength I had, I ran. Jumping on the bike, kickstarting it, and shoving it all at the same time was very hard. Somehow, while I was doing all of this, I never stopped hearing the footsteps behind me. I knew wh whatever it was, it was only a few yards behind me. Once I was on my way, I felt a sudden breeze on my back like something had made a swipe at me and just missed. This scared me even more and put more energy and urgency into me. As I slammed the bike into gear, I gave the bike all that it had. I was shifting gears and sliding around every corner like I was a professional. I looked back once and I could see the trees moving, but I was never able to see anything. Even though I did not see anything, it did not take away my sense of emergency to get out of those woods. Once I made it back to the road, I stopped, turned the bike off, and tried to gather myself. It took me a few minutes, but as I did I heard it. The most god-awful scream I had ever heard. It started out low, but by the time that it ended, it was so loud that I I could feel it in my chest. I got that bike going and got home as fast as I could. It took me a long time before I went back into those woods, but when I did finally go back, it would always be with friends. 
this was a moment in my life that I will never forget. Hey guys, Uncle Unit here. I hope you enjoyed these throwback stories from the 1980s. A very special thank you to my good friend Swamp Dweller for joining me in this video. If you enjoy scary stories and you'll really dig his channel, a link will be in the description. If you have a scary story that you would like to share, send it my way at unit522stories at outlook.com. This channel's primary source for stories comes from viewers like you, so any submissions are very much appreciated. Have a great weekend, and as always, never forget. There's always a